Well, hello, Ephraim, and welcome once again. We thank you for joining us today. We're going to continue our teach on what we started last week in the series, and that's on divine guidance. And it's, it's such an important topic to be properly led by the Father's ways and the ways that the Father set it up and the, the, the tools that he gave us. And what we're going to do today is we're going to go through this, and believe it or not, we're going to bake a cake. Yes, I'm going to bake a cake with you. I wouldn't eat my cake, but I'll eat the spiritual cake that we can make out of this. Because what a cake takes is ingredients. And you have to put the ingredients in properly. Things have to set properly. They have to, however you bake a cake, I'm not really familiar with it. All I know is they come in a box. So, but you have to, somebody actually has to go through the process and put the ingredients together. And once you have all the ingredients together, mixed up properly, cooked properly, iced properly. It looks like a beautiful cake and it tastes absolutely phenomenal. And for those of you who are wondering, in case anybody ever wanted to make me one, my favorite is Black Forest. And everybody in my family knows it because when I buy cakes for somebody's birthday, I buy what I think they want, Black Forest. So let's go to prayer and let's start this thing off today. Father, we come before you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you, Father, for moving within our lives and within your people and drawing us to our perfect destiny, Father, aligning our will and our choices with your will, Father. And that's the only way it gets done within our walk, Father. We succeed to that. And right now we take authority of every spirit of darkness that will try and rise up and steer people astray. We bind you in Yeshua's name. What I bind in this earth is bound in heaven itself. And we release the power of the Rahakadish to go forth, forth to minister and massage the hearts of people around the face of this earth so that they can hear and be properly led by your ways, Father. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. So we're going to start off in John 8, 29, and there's not too many scripture verses today, but we have a lot of points, and I would encourage you to grab a pen and a paper, and I'm, I do have them numbered, actually. And, you know, when you make an ingredient, you know, and put something together, you know, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. And that's the way we're going to go through this today. So in John 8, 29, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. So again, everything that we have to do has to go back to the Father. And that's Jesus Christ there talking. But he himself was even talking about taking it back to the Father, taking it right back to the Father. You know, when we get into things of divine guidance, here we're going to get into some points here. You see, the Holy Spirit enables our human spirit to do two things, and that is to do God's known well, and the second one is to be motivated to be Father pleasers. And that, that's what enables us. Now, we still have choice to make into that, even though it's God's known will for our lives, we still make choices into his will for us. You see, and this is not about trying to be super spiritual. There's nothing about that. This isn't about trying to get people to get eyes on you or you working in the gifts so that people can look at you. This is all about, back to John 8, 29, those things that please the Father. Anytime ego gets in the way, anytime humanism gets in the way, Anytime somebody wants eyes on them as to be, you know, one of the holy ones and everybody, oh, look how holy they must be, you know, because you go through the ritually impure things and unclean things and people will still do this every week around the face of the earth. And then they think they're pleasing God and they're absolutely not pleasing God. You know what that's called? It's called elevating yourself. And I've been talking a lot about that, even with Gnosticism and making a God of yourself. And You've got to be really careful with the things of the Father and, and, and handle them delicately because God is God. And he's got a structure, he's got an order, and he's got things that he wants done. And if we start elevating ourselves and getting eyes on us, we're making ourselves like God. And that's not going to be honored by him at all. And in fact, it's going to turn the other way and it's going to bite you in the backside. You see, but we're supposed to do exactly what was specifically that what which was assigned to us, assigned to us from the foundations of the earth. It's called your destiny. The reason why you're on the face of the earth. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. You see, but what happened is we got away from that agenda 
that God had set for us for our lives on the face of the earth to serve within his, within his army, and we got into our own agenda, or we got into an agenda of the religious agenda, the agenda of the church, the agenda of doctrine, the agenda of this, and we do things this way because this is what our church teaches, and we completely got away from what the Father assigned to us from the foundations of the earth as to what you're supposed to be doing. You see, there are rules to every game that you play, and there are rules to this game, and there's an ingredient to this game that, we, that we're going to put together here today. You see, you don't just automatically wake up one day and you know, volunteer for a position. You don't volunteer to be a, a teacher. <clears throat> Excuse me. You don't volunteer to be an apostle. You don't volunteer to be a prophet. You see, these are things that have to be worked into, and if you think that's in your life, you've got to sit under somebody, and we sat under somebody that could straighten us out, and sometimes we didn't even realize it for six months afterwards what he was really getting at when we were getting straightened out, but people always have to be straightened out. Again, there's a set of train tracks. The train gets a little bit derailed. We have to push it back on, and that's the train of your life, and that's the whole responsibility and the obligation because you will mess up. You will mess up. And when it comes to the body, the body has messed up and the prophets have been trying to push them back on the tracks for a long time. But at the same time, they don't listen. They don't listen. Romans 8, verse 9. Romans 8, verse 9. See, you can't be called into any aspect of what we just talked about, the fivefold ministry. You know, when you're going to serve God, it says persecution arises for the, for the word's sake. People think that just because it's an easy thing that that's the way it should go. You know, the things that you get into with the Father, you're going to pay a price. You're going to pay a price. If everything were to come easy, where would your faith be? You see, you've got to have a faith project in front of you, and you've got to pay the price to go through that, even the purpose of temptation, which you can't see the chart from there. <coughs> Excuse me. You've got to pay a price to go through that. Even with that, there's a promise. It's linked to a condition or a principle, which is followed by a problem or a temptation. You've got to prove yourself all the way through that. But if it's just everything's going to be easy, that's not the way of the Father. He wants you hardened. He needs us hardened into his ways. Romans 8, verse 9. But you... You do not identify with your old nature, but with the Spirit, provided the Spirit of God is, is living inside of you. Well, key word there, provided the Spirit of God is living inside of you. For anyone who doesn't have the Spirit of the Messiah does not belong to him. You see, two points here. We're going to get going on this. One, the Holy Ghost leads us by the inward prompting. And that's how most of us are going to be communicated with, believe it or not. All his activities are guided with the outward witness, the written word of God. That's the second point there. But I like that first one, the inward prompting. How many times, and I, when I was learning this stuff and what was actually going on and how I was being guided, how many times did we make mistakes and then go, oh, that's what that was about? Oh, that's what that was about. You know why? Because sometimes hindsight is 2020. But then you get to the point in time where you trust those inward promptings that come and you start to rely on them. And God communicates like that. He's got other ways that He communicates with people, and I have other ways that He, he communicates with me as well. You see, but what I didn't talk about here was anything like, you know, God communicating by, say, gold dust, rubies, diamonds. You see, the way that God always does things is always consistent right back with his outward witness, the word, the written word of God. And you don't find that kind of stuff in there, and it's absolute nonsense. You see, there are things that go on with that. And yes, there is a manifestation, but it's not the manifestation of God. You know, sometimes they found some... That gold dust they found at the duck work, they can find it wherever. But if they didn't, guess what? You better really take a good hard look because I'll tell you exactly what that is all about. That's a familiar spirit. 
That's a familiar spirit manifesting itself to get eyes on it and eyes on the preacher. You know, when it comes to the things of manifesting like that, oh, something that would be consistent with Scripture, how about the glory cloud? How about the glory cloud? Had an experience with that not too long ago. Interesting, absolutely interesting. Romans 8, 14. All who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons. All who are led by God's Spirit are, by, are God's sons. You see, you have to be led by the Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of the Father. And it makes you question when you see some people do some pretty crazy things sometimes. Yeah, they're being led, but what are they being led by? What's that imprompting that they've got going on inside of them that's steering them off the tracks? There's something there that needs to be taken care of. So it talks there about sons. I'll read that scripture again. All who are led by God's spirit are God's sons. When it talks about sons there, it's talking about maturity. This is the first part of the ingredient. Maturity, responsibility, and the ability to make decisions by God. The second point, it's about being richly motivated for growth and change deeper into the things of the Father. Not creating some new denomination, not creating some new doctrine, but being motivated into the things of the Father where the Father is going. The third point, an existing life with, with fulfillment. You got to have that. The fourth, guidance is a prerequisite to shaping our conduct and fulfilling our mission. Guidance is a prerequisite. Before you can get into shaping your conduct, you have to be guided into being able to shape your conduct into the ways of the Father and fulfilling your mission. You have to be guided and have that guidance system in place to fulfill your mission, why you are on the face of the earth to do the bidding for the Father for what he has set you and designed you to do. The number five, fruit. Here's a good definition of the fruit. Fruit is a settled sense of security. A settled sense of security, making sure that you have it what? Put in place. A settled sense of security, knowing that what he has to say and knowing what he wants. You know, but when you get into the things of the fruit, patience, love, joy, peace. If you're lacking any of that stuff, go back and top that stuff up because you need that to be properly guided. You had to have to have that settlement because you've got to be able to rely on the word of God. And if you can't rely on the word of God, then you're not going to be able to have things like peace. So you have to make sure that you've got that in place. Fruit is a, a settled sense of security, knowing what he has to say and knowing what he wants. You see, we're not, we're not everybody thinks divine guidance. Woo! Divine guidance. You know what divine guidance isn't? It's not about your dreams. It's not about a voice. It's not about a vision. It's about guidance and knowing what he wants. That's what it's about. And finding out how he's going to communicate with you. You know, it talks in scripture. Yes, at a certain point in time, it says, and then old men shall dream dreams. Time to come. And a time to come. It's not about dreams. That's not how you're led. Dreams need interpretation by somebody else. That's, again, divine guidance, because that's the way God has always done it. It always has to go back to his word and the consistency of his word. The sixth point here, we're going to talk a little bit here about rebellion. Because we're at the age of rebellion. We're at the age when people are questioning all authority. And you know what you're doing when you do that? You are absolutely shaking your fist in God's face in defiance. And he'll let you get away for, it with so, for so long, and then he's going to do something about it. And it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be pretty. 
But people, oh, it's got to, I have to know first. It has to be me. And uh, You know what? Are you that arrogant? Are you that arrogant? But we've got a re rebellious, arrogant, snot-nosed nation, a people, God's nation for the most part as well, thinking that it's got to come through them. And if nobody else knows what we know, then no way. But that's not how it works. God has never worked like that. That's not consistent with him. You see, we got off track when the teachers were launched, and then the teachers came through the charismatic movement. And then at that point in time, they started thinking that they knew more, more about the word than what was going on behind the bema. And that's not right, because that's a problem. If you think like that, you need to be delivered. And if you are absolutely like that, well, then you have another problem. You need to get out of where you're at. You need to get out of where you're at. The seventh point. The final authority is God's word. But what happens? We rebel against it. You see, when there's tension and there's conflict between control and freedom, and there's a great amount of stress that goes on between them, you look into Scripture, when God talks in, in Scripture, and you've heard us talk about it for about the last year, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. That's freedom. Thy will be done. That's control. It's God's control to us. Why? Because he loves us. He wants what he has set up in store for us, and he wants us to be able to partake and what he's got here on the face of the earth as well as in eternity and what he's done for us for that so that we can spend eternity with him by sending his son to the face of the earth. Thy kingdom come, freedom. Thy will be done, control. The eighth point. You see, scripture reveals we are under God's authority and his word. The scripture reveals we are under God's authority and his word and his structure and the way that he does things. But people don't like to hear that. No, because thy kingdom come. They want their king, <clears throat> kingdom to come so that they can have the freedom to do what they want to do. Which kingdom do you want to partake in? Pick. Thy will be done. Is it your will that you want done? Or your perspective or the way that you see things? Who are you trying to control? And what's controlling you once again? Number nine. He's a father to us. That knows his will for us. And how he wills for us. And that he loves us that much. You know that God already knows what you're wanting. Let me ask you this question. Do you will for what you want for your life, or do you get yourself in a position to be led? Do you will yourself out of the position in which you've been set on the face of the earth for? Let's look at it from the negative. And that often happens. I want, I want, I want, I want. Yeah, you want your kingdom to come. You want your will to be done. This is about the Father. And the Father's will and what he's got for your life. And it's about you lining your life up with the will that he has set from the foundations that you were ever created from. From the foundations of the earth. And you aligning yourself up with the, his will. But that's a choice. You've got all the choice in the world that you can have into that. It doesn't mean it's going to get you anywhere if you choose poorly. He already told us, choose wisely. Choose wisely. You see, when you get into this stuff, though, and, and people get this thing all off course, and you don't hear this stuff taught very much about everybody wants to, oh, it's the dreams and the visions and all the other, because that's what they think spirituality is. That's not spirituality. Let me tell you something, first of all. That's a false sense of spirituality. And then people want to profess all this stuff all over the internet or call up or send emails and do all that kind of kinds of crazy things. Take care of your familiar spirits. But most ministry never came up properly at the same time either. 
you know, just because you went to a seminary school or you went to some Bible college, just because you get that diploma, that means absolutely nothing to God. What Bible school did Jesus go to? What about Peter and the guys? What about Adam? What about Moses? What about the prophets? You know, a lot of that stuff you get indoctrinated, it's no different than going to regular your college or university these days. You've got to really watch because you get taught their doctrine, their way, the way that they want you to think. They want their kingdom, their kingdom, because there's a lot of fallacies that are taught, and they want you to go out there and repeat their will be done. You see, and what happens is you come out of there and everybody gets ordained as a certain thing. Oh, now you're a pastor. You can go start up, have, have, have a church. No. You come out of there with a certificate, and you're not even ordained into the fivefold ministry in any of the offices. And the whole thing gets crazy. You know, you used to be able to get a minister's license on the back of a cereal box. You used to be able to get them on the back of a magazine. That's a literal one. You can literally go on the internet and have one. I could have one in the next hour. That has nothing to do with the fact of what God wants and you coming up properly under, under ministry. And then they get themselves in trouble because they're not ready. And then they start going down a path and they start trying to impress people. And then they start trying to preach things that they're not ready to teach. Because you got to live it before you preach it. Trust me. You have to live it before you preach it. Because when you preach it, you're going to live it. When I preach attitude of the heart every year, my heart's going to get tested every year. Something's going to arise every time I go through it. My wife says, oh, no, do you have to do that? Well, why? Because it's going to happen. We know what's going to happen. When I teach the purpose of temptation every two years, what happens? You're going to go through the purpose of temptation because you're going to live what you're teaching, but you've got to live it before you preach it and get an understanding of it, and that's where people get, in problem, get, get into problems. We get people just want to do whatever they want to do out here in this world and get into the deep end and, you know, they come out and all the first thing they want to talk about is demonology. Are you sure? Are you sure? We're going to get into that here in a little bit because you, what we're talking about here is divine guidance, but a lot of this has to do with being able to combat the, the things of light. You know, when we mentor people, we bring people in, we protect them by staying in with a certain CD's and certain teachings, and they go through that stuff that they've been studying for a long time. It's not about holding them in a certain spot. It's about protecting them. That's why it's done the way that it's done. Because otherwise, they can get their lives in a real big trouble. And we live in perilous times. Perilous times that this earth hasn't seen. And you start letting people just go out there and go wild and teach whatever they want sometimes. What happens? They're going to get bombarded. And they're going to fail. And that's not what God wants for anybody's life. But there's a certain way to go about it. There's a certain way to bring it up. There's a certain way to bring it through. You see, God doesn't tell, tell us everything. He doesn't just tell prophets everything either. And that's one of the biggest misconstrued things that people have in their head that were soothsayers. Your mouthpieces of God. That's what a prophet is. Teachers have to stay in their lane too. Apostles have to stay in their lane. Evangelists have to stay in their lane. But they put the demand that we know everything in, in certain offices. And that's simply not the case because he uses us all. He uses us as, as all to, to fit things and bring things together. It's not a one-man show. It never has been. But what happens is people want to play Lone Ranger. 
And they don't want to be accountable to anyone. They want to be able to say what they want when they want to say it again. Whose kingdom come? Whose will be done? Thought it's about the Father. It's about bringing it all together. That's the way the Father does things. That's the way God wants it done. You get into see, see some people who out there who have absolutely gone out there and, you know, we had the, what was it, 1988 and 88 ways or whatever it was and the rapture and all that stuff and people were out here prophesying that. We heard the, the, the guy that was prophesying something about another date that the rapture was coming. Oh, then he made a miscalculation. Then he went on to say, and what? It ain't happening. It ain't happening. You realize that palm readers get more right than some of these guys? And they do. Why? Because they're operating by a spirit as well. But God doesn't honor that, obviously. He doesn't want you at the palm reader operating with a familiar spirit. He wants you to operate by his spirit inside of you. But sometimes people don't even care if it's of darkness they open themselves up and they will take it because they want to know the future. Dangerous stuff, people. It's dangerous stuff. Dangerous stuff. Let me tell you something. These guys that are missing, real prophets don't miss. They can get into error. A little bit of error, but they don't miss the mains. They don't miss the mains. And just because somebody does, sometimes there's immaturity in a, in, a, in a prophet as well. And if they say something and it doesn't come to pass, guess what? Sometimes they can miss God. We can all miss God. You can miss God. But the seasoned, tried, tested, true, the ones that have made mistakes, the ones that have been raked over the coals, the ones that have had the correction, the harsh correction, get it right. They don't miss. They don't miss. And another thing we don't do either is we're not going to use the word and weaponize the word to use it against the people. That's not what the word was ever designed for. You know what the word was designed for? It was, to, it was designed to be a love story to, his, to God's people. That's why God made it. That's why he put it out there, because he loves us that much. It is a love story. It's a love novel. It's a love book, because he wants us in perfect perfection so that we can align ourselves with him he doesn't want us aligned with the things of this world and get things all screwed up within our lives i don't know how much of this i want to hammer on you know that people uh, with our mentor with prophet tom people have said from different bemas, not to go to his meetings anymore at one point in time when he was still alive and still hosting them. Because it didn't fit their style, their ideology. Didn't fit their doctrine. They didn't like the ways of the pro of prophets and the harshness that came with it. Like, what kind of God do you think we serve and what kind of fallacy are you living? Yes, God's all love, but love comes in many packages. Correction comes within, within many packages. I was just fortunate that I was corrected by my father in love, and many, many people weren't corrected by their fathers in love. There's different things like abuses and stuff like that. But he loved you. God loves us. God loves us to the point that God will correct us. Properly. It's going to be interesting one day, isn't it? Get to stand before the Father. And hear what? Well, you pointed a finger over here and you pointed a finger over there. Let me ask you the question. And he asked it many times. What if he's right? And let me tell you something. I know he was. I know he was. But people never want to hear that kind of stuff. They don't want to hear that stuff. You see, what prophets do, we're not there to give you your latest, you know, you got to go out on Tuesday and you need to buy this and do that. 
It's not what it's about. We will warn, warn you of things to come. Warn you of things to come. And that's why without the angelic forces, we are in big trouble if we don't have the divine things of the Father in place. Because that's for the nations. That's for the people. Your divine guidance is for your life, for who you are. And when you get things put together, guess what? The barrel will not run empty just as it happened before. Hey, go bake me a little bread and then make a little for yourself. It worked. The consistency of God works. The consistency of God works. But it's your choice to listen or not. We've all got choices. But let me tell you, if you're not going to, you're on your own and you won't make it. It's just as easy as that. You see, God will say, I sent my prophet. You'll stand before him one day. He'll say, I sent my prophet during your time of visitation, and you listen not. You missed it. Try to get ministers to listen too, don't we? Let me tell you what's going to happen with the churches. They're going to have to let the people go. The angel showed up and said, tell the church to let my people go long ago. You see, there are plagues that are coming to the face of this earth. And the pastors are not going to be able to do anything for the, for the people. They're not going to be able to help you. They're not going to be able to give you any direction. And they will, they will let the people go because they're not going to have the answers for it. And they're going to have to take a good, hard look at their life and their walk. And they're going to have to realize that they are set in an office, but that office that they are set in has got such a demand on it now that they have no choice but to fail. They're not there to bring you ways out of situation. They're there to guide the sheep. But again, the people demand. The people demand. The people demand. And what we can't do is bite onto it. When you're sitting in one of the fivefold offices, you cannot bite onto the demand of the people. And then once you latch onto it, they drag you away from the things that your office has put in place for to help guide people in that aspect of it. But just as it happened in Egypt, just as we're going to have the plagues of Egypt in the end time, that's how it's going to go. They will let the people go. Am I saying the church is Egypt? I'm saying the church is Egypt. But they will let the people go. They're God's people. And this is why we're structured the way that we're structured. Because we need teachers. We need people all over. We need people in place. Because the ministry has got to bring forth the ministry within the lives of the people. And that's why we go to homes and we have groups and fellowships. And one day, the, guess what? The prodigal son will go home. But we're not going to go there empty-handed. We're not going to go there with no talent. We're not going to go there with no organization. We're going to show up and say, what? Here we are. Somebody do it for us? You wuss. Get it put together. Get it put in place. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Just remember one thing, too. The land in which we're in, this is not our land. And the day goes by closer and closer. Every single day that you wake up or every single night that you go to bed, you're one day closer to going home. Try and get back to the land first before you make it home to the Father. But this is what the Father wants. He will gather his people and he will take us back. In his due time, not before his due time, in his due time. And what do we got to do? Prepare, prepare, prepare. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. In days gone by, God spoke in many ways, in varied ways, to the fathers throughout the prophet, or through the prophets. The tenth point, that, we, that was number nine. 
The tenth point. God will speak in many ways in order for him to find us and make us hear. He will try different ways to get your attention. But if you're not going to spend time thinking about the Father, meditating on the Word of God, spending time with him, not injecting your own opinions into it, he's going to try and find a way to communicate with you. Why? Because, again, he loves you. He wants you to understand his love letter to you, which is his word. And I'm talking the entirety of it. Genesis through Revelation. All of it. The 11th one. We have God's moral expressions and safeguards for everyone that he loves. Everyone. God's moral expressions. Safeguards for everyone that he loves. Twelfth one, his voice is not always welcome. Again, most of the things you're going to hear is about stop doing this, get this straightened up in your life. Look over here, get that cleaned up in your life. Oh, but I wanted a word for everybody else. And God said, you clean yourself up. You work on you. You take a good hard look into your own life. And people don't like that. They don't, they don't welcome that. You should. He's doing it again. Why? Because it's his love letter to you. He's trying to explain his love letter to you and how he wants you to worship and to love him back. But he needs you clean to do it. Otherwise, you cannot love him because you're into sin. Sin makes you dirty. He doesn't want dirty kids. He wants you clean. He wants you whole. The 13th point. We were wondering, wandering when he found us. And people always say, hey, I found God. And that's great that they say that. Let me tell you something, though. No, you didn't. He found you. He found you in his due time. He presented himself to you. You just had to make a choice. He presented his will to you, for you. And all you had to do was choose into it and then try and align your will with his will and keep making the proper choices all the way through it. So do you have free will? <laughs> I'd say no. You have free choice. Big difference between will and choice. Your will is set by the Father. His will, sorry, is set for your life by the Father. You choose to align your, your will with his, what he's got for you for your destiny. Number 14, he offered to be our helper and guide. And some of us said, yes. And some people said, no. Choose. Choose. That's the end of the recipe there. You see, the scriptures include these seven things. I'm going to go through these really quick. The first one, the word is objective and self-revealed. Talk about the word of God here, the scriptures. The thing that we always have to line everything up to and parallel back and forth within. God's word is a voice. It's a voice. So you shouldn't be lost in your own wanderings. Your answers are right in there. He caused it to be written. And he wants us to know how he goes about doing things. He wants us to know his consistency so we can operate our lives and mold our lives the way that he is. The second point, I said there were seven. I just had to have three and one there. Everything is redemptive in its nature and purpose. This is what the scriptures are all about. Everything is redemptive in its nature and purpose. It answers questions in order to be saved with love, to have purpose, to have the philosophy of life, moral standards for us to live by. And what are we talking about there? Uh, that's what the law is. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You can live a pretty clean life and present yourself as a pretty clean bride to Messiah by following that right there. Oh, but you don't need those rules? Oh, yeah, you do. 
because it's redemptive in its nature. It's redemptive in its purpose. And that's what it's all about. It's about getting yourself rightly related to God and rightly related to your brothers and to your sisters. The third point about God's scriptures, God is a spirit. God's a spirit. The scriptures are spirit and life. Give them for spiritual understanding of the living God. And that's why the word should be personal to you. The word of God should be personal to you. The fourth one, the word speaks to all life in every situation. If you properly grasp the word, if you've got fruit put in there, if you've got the joy and the peace working through you, walking through you, but you got to have that fruit in there because the word speaks to all life in every situation. If you properly grasp the word with joy and peace, you have to have the fruit or you're not going to properly grasp the word, which means you're going to improperly apply it to your walk all because you didn't do what? You didn't take care of the basic rudiments of looking in your life and looking for the fruit of the spirit. The fifth point here, the principles of the scripture work every time. It's just a matter of whether you want to believe it or not. That's what it comes down to. The sixth point, experience. Experience? Yeah, you need to re-examine your experience and your experiences within the word. Because we've all spoke things that we shouldn't have spoke. You're healed one day, then you're talking about how you, you hurt. Talking doubt and unbelief into situations that you're believing for. Examine those things. Find out where you went wrong. That's what I talk about, looking into your life. Examine your life. Examine your experiences. Examine maybe where you went wrong with something. Examine over the course of the day. Examine before you go to bed. Meditate on your day. And just think about your walk. Where did I screw up? Could I have done something better? And then make the adjustment, make the improvement. And the seventh, the word is final. The word is final. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't slip away from it. Don't slip away from the lifestyle that we are to adhere to. There's so much here that we're doing, and we're doing it for a reason, not just because we just decided to make something up one day. It's not about making stuff up. It's not about doing it our way. It's about doing things the Father's way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Align yourself with his will. Because you know what happens? You're going to have to stop. And you're going to have to answer this statement or this question. What does God know that we don't know? What does God know that we don't know? You're going to have to ask, answer that one day because you're going to make some decisions and you're going to say, uh, oops. Oops. See, God knows that you need to be guided. That's one thing he does know. And the system God set up is to govern our spirit man. At the same time, he gave us the five senses to guide our flesh and govern our flesh because if we were truly led by the Spirit, we wouldn't need the five senses. You'd be able to walk up to something and say, that's hot, I'm not touching it. But what do we do? Oh. Touch it. If you're not led by the Spirit. You see, but they get in the way. They get in the way of your spirit, man. Your mind... Let me tell you, something. your mind, and there's been a lot of talk on this. We've been I've taught war for your mind for probably 10 years now. Do that about once a year, too. Your mind is your worst enemy. Not darkness, not the devil. Your mind. Yours. To you, your mind. You see, darkness is under our feet. But what's the playground going on inside of you? inside of your head because if darkness can get on you if he can start to badger you and, and you start giving into that darkness you have to understand rule there are rules to combat darkness and sometimes it just gets away on you again 
the reason why we mentor the way we mentor is to protect. It's to protect. But darkness will come and he will come and he will try and make a run. He always tries to make a run. He'll try to get you to say things. He'll try to get you to, to prove to you that the word of God is not true, that there's fallacies, that there's lies, that this doesn't line up and this and that. That is not the spirit of God. That's not the spirit of God coming to you. That's darkness. Don't doubt, though. Don't doubt and unbelief. But what did God say through the whole thing? Just believe. Just believe my word. You see, he wants you to succeed. He wants you to understand the guidance process and the guidance system. His word is spirit of life and life to those who will find it. And he wants you to find it. But you have to have the joy. You have to have the peace. Let me tell you something. There's got to be some long suffering in there. There's got to be patience in there. But you have to have your spirit inside of you in contact with the spirit of God. That's divine guidance. Not dreams, not visions. Through the word, through the word. You know, you ever wonder why you go to bed sometimes and you're working something out in your head and then you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, it's right there in front of me. Why didn't I see it last night? Because while you were sleeping, your spirit man was working these things out for God. And that's going to be about 99% of the way that everybody's guided. And then you go, oh, that makes sense. Oh, well, I wanted to have a dream and I wanted to have a vision. We're trying to protect you by saying that that's not the way most people are going to be guided. But your spirit man deals and connects with the spirit of God. And then you just have that inner, oh, I know that. That's how it works. It's that simple. But you have to know the rules. Or you might end up dying trying, trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together, trying to figure it out. You may just end up die trying because you're going to touch into things that you cannot combat. You're going to touch into things that you can't combat. Why? John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh in order to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come so that they may have life, life in its fullest measure. See, if you're going to take on darkness with light, you have to know how to apply it. You have to know how to apply it. You can't do anything with your flesh. It's combated in the spirit. So if people want to look holy, dress like dress the part, make everybody think that they're walking the part, and then internally, your spirit man's not connected with the Father, and you think you're going to take on anything to do with darkness? Let me tell you something. Freight train, freight train coming. But one, remember one thing as we go through this. I'm not your God. Prophet Steve, Prophet Mike Terry, we are not your God. And you know that. We don't elevate ourselves to the, to the Father's level, but there is an order. But we are not your God and we are not your soothsayers. We will warn people. You get warned all the time. Let me give you a warning. Stock up on meat, and I apologize, Ephraim. I should have told you that six months ago when it came to me, and I just thought it was for me and my wife, and I should have been telling everybody. Stock up on meat heavily. We've been stocking up on it for six or nine months now. And let me tell you something. Go to the grocery store and find your sales. There's your sign. With all this, though, what we all have to do, and we'll wrap up with this, we all have to learn to be consistent with fasting and prayer. You know, I know we went through that when we were being mentored into our seven years of schooling. Fasting and prayer. Fasting and prayer. Fasting and prayer. 
And I watched a man who did it for years, decades, and where it got him. Let me ask you this question. What makes us any different? Nothing. Why did Jesus Christ himself fast for 40 days and 40 nights? As soon as that got done, who did he take on? Darkness. Who fleed from him? Who fleed from him? Darkness. After all the temptation that was put in front of him, he was able to take it on. He was able to stay the course because he focused and he was making sure that he was constantly connected with his father. Talk about Jesus Christ here. And his spirit man, one with the father. And that's what we've got to do. That's your recipe for divine guidance. Let's close in prayer. Father, we come before you and we thank you, Father. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for moving within our lives. And we thank you, Father, so much for our guidance. Your guidance, Father, within our lives. Continue to open our eyes. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, Father. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Enjoy your week, everybody. We'll see you right back here. Same time, same place next week.